Today in this video, what I want to do is actually talk about something that affects all of us, and that is the banking system that we all find ourselves participating in. For some of you, you're going to understand how fractional banking works. And for some of you, this might be new to you and you're just hearing about this for the first time. But what I want to do is try and take something that is incredibly complicated and simplify it down into a way that is easy to understand. And I also want to explain why it's important and how it affects you in your daily lives. And I'm not talking about just going to the bank, getting loans and stuff like that. I want you to understand how money is actually created because it may not be what you think. And when you realize how we live our lives, how we're governed by this system of banking, it may shape the way you consider doing your personal finances in the future. It may shape the way you teach your children about money. And most importantly, what I'm hoping that it'll do is shape the way you listen and understand what politicians are saying when it comes to money, when they're campaigning and you think that maybe they're talking about jobs and different services that they want to promise to the public, what they're actually talking about is economics. And by watching this video, I'm hoping that you get a better appreciation for what they're really, truly talking about. I'm going to talk about banking in terms of a thought experiment. That's something new. I want to explain to you how money is actually created. In this scenario, let's suppose you are a bank and within your bank, you have money. Let's assume that you and your bank only have $1. That's it. There is no other money in existence on planet earth. You have $1 in your bank and it is the only money. This is known as the principal amount. And let's say you have somebody who comes to your bank and says, Hey, can I borrow your $1? And you say, sure. At 10% interest, this to you probably seems like a normal transaction. Nothing new here, but this is where it's really going to get tricky. Really focus on the idea that there's only $1 in all of existence on the entire planet. As you transfer that money, because you've agreed to the loan, it goes to your customer. If you think about this, you borrowed a dollar at 10% interest. You now have debt of 10 cents. So in order for the borrower to pay back the entire amount, they have to pay back both the principal and the interest. So they're indebted to you a dollar 10, but where does the dime come from? If the only money that actually physically exists is the principal amount. Let's take this example one step further. What does the person do with that $1? They'll likely take it and they'll deposit it into another bank. And under typical rules of banking, you have something called a reserve rate. Example here, I'm going to use 10%. So 10% of the deposit must remain in the bank's vault. This is known as the reserve rate. So we're going to assume that the bank has to keep 10% of that dollar in the bank when your first customer deposits it. The bank is technically allowed to loan out 90%. So what happens if we set off this chain reaction of events? What we see is each person will deposit a dollar into their bank or in the next person's case, they'll only be allowed to deposit 90 cents because we've held back a dime. So if you look at this, you've got 90 cents goes into the first account. Then because the bank must keep 10% in their vault, they can loan out 81 cents of that and so on and so on. So that original dollar, the only dollar that was created out of principal amount in the original scenario, that money then gets extended out to an additional $9. So out of thin air, we're creating from $1, a total of $10. So this goes back to the original question. How is it that your first customer is again going to pay off the dime? If in order for them to get out of the entire loan, they owe a dollar 10, how are they going to pay back and be free of that loan when only $1 actually exists? 
Well, here's the issue. In order to pay back that dollar ten, that ten cents has to come out of all of this. This is the circulation of non-existent money into an economy. So that ten cents is going to somehow get redistributed or siphoned out of the fictitious amount of money that was created from the original one dollar. So this is particularly scary, and I want you to consider it like this. How you pay this back is you have to convert your real time and effort into paying back something that doesn't exist with something else that doesn't exist. In exchange for your real physical property. So for example, if you don't pay back that interest payment, well, you risk losing all of the assets that you've used to borrow that money to begin with. Now, I want to take this a step further and talk about what this also means to you when you consider what the government does. What's important for you to understand is up until 1974, the Bank of Canada, which is the only national bank of the G7 countries that is owned by the people of Canada, that's you and me. It's not a conglomerate or a corporation of any kind that is owned by outside banking interests. But what you have to understand about the Bank of Canada is that World War I, World War II, all of the 400 series highways, most universities, most colleges, hospitals, were all funded through the Bank of Canada at virtually interest-free. Other than administrative costs, it didn't cost you and I any money. So when we look at the state of healthcare in this country, or we look at the state of education in this country, the rising costs of tuitions, the lack of doctors, the lack of nurses, the lack of hospital beds and good healthcare that we would expect from all the tax dollars that we pay, it's getting siphoned off into banks. In 1974, Pierre Elliott Trudeau changed the banking regulations in this country and stopped borrowing money from his own bank, the Bank of Canada, as the bank of first resort. Instead, the Bank of Canada has now become the lender of last resort for all governments, including provincial and federal governments. This is a problem for all of us because we are the ones that are expected to pay this rising debt cost. This is particularly dangerous because mathematically our banking system must actually fail. In the future, it's going to be impossible for us to keep up with the interest payments on all of the loans that each of the levels of government have taken on our behalf. Here's the real reason I've done this video to talk about this whole issue. And I want to talk about new tax schemes, things like carbon tax. Every government that comes into power is going to have to come up with some new form of tax scheme. Yes, the environment is important. I understand that. But what we're seeing is it's not really about the environment, is it? It's about the government putting forward a tax scheme that would be perceived to be in the best interest of all Canadians. But in reality, the carbon tax is not going to go back into the environment. You're going to transfer wealth from one person to another person. You and I, the average consumer, are going to have to bear the brunt of that, making it difficult for us to put fuel in our vehicles or heat our homes. But in reality, our options are we either pay for the gas in our vehicles or we pay the interest on loans and our taxes have to go up regardless. This is what these tax schemes are really about. It's not about the environment. It's about a creative new way for the government to dig itself out of the amount of debt that they have taken on through frivolous spending like wars overseas. The reality is this. No government coming into power can afford to repeal taxes. And every government coming into power is going to have to find creative ways to pay off the debt that the previous government has incurred. Unfortunately, you and I are the ones who really, through our efforts, through our real time and energy, are going to be the ones have to convert our labor into paying off 
these fictitious amounts of money that could have been all this time, all these years since 1974, being reinvested back into society. And unfortunately, Pierre Elliott Trudeau started the ball rolling, and his son, Justin Trudeau, has doubled the federal debt in the last three years. This problem is guaranteed to be passed on to the future of our children in the form of crippling debt. This isn't an issue about the environment, so paying for ridiculous loans that we should have never had to incur to begin with. This is from the Ontario budget for 2023. And if you look at the year 2022 to 23, all the way out to 25, each year, the government of Ontario has interest payments that they have to make on loans from your taxes. In over three years, Ontario residents are going to be responsible through their tax dollars to pay $41.9 billion. Look at this per hour. If you're an Ontario resident, you're responsible for a piece of this debt through your taxes as an Ontario resident. But you don't just live in the province of Ontario. You actually live in Canada. We have a federal government. And this is what I took from the federal budget this year. Public debt charges are expected to increase from $34.5 billion this year to $50.3 billion in 2027-28. If we just look at the low number for this year, $34.5 billion on federal interest payments. That comes down to $3.9 million per hour. And in a couple years, it's going to rise to $5.7 million per hour. So if you're an Ontario resident, you get the federal per hour debt and you get the provincial. So what does this mean for somebody living in Ontario? You're responsible for a piece of $5.43 million per hour. So why is this important? Why did I do this video? And the reason is this, because I want to highlight the fact that as I demonstrated earlier, interest doesn't exist. And a large portion of the actual money in circulation doesn't exist either. And that's done through the magic of the fractured monetary system. So I want you to pay attention very closely to politicians in the future when they're talking about the economy and they're talking about deficit spending. Because it is your physical labor, your time, and your effort that you put forward, which is real, for something that the politicians pay for that doesn't actually exist, and they pay for it on your back. So it's important for you and me and everybody in the community within society to understand what's really going on. So with that, thank you for watching. <laughs>